previously on The Forbidden Game. Ginny and her friends decide to lie to the police and tell them that Summer's disappearance is probably linked to those two shady guys. Now it's revealed that those guys are also currently missing. Slug and PC. Slug and PC are the names of these real boys. Everyone tells me I've changed and if you don't like me anymore, then break up with me. <gasps> Silence. Don't you two see? Julian is winning. Sure enough, the paper house from the game is on the floor and so are all of its playing pieces, but it's exploded as if something had burst out from inside of it. It's the night of the prop. So Jenny looks up and what do you know? He has white hair and an all black tux. It's Julian. He's like, you know what? Um, Let's call this game, I'm kidnapping your friends one by one. Audrey has disappeared. She's been stolen. A paper doll sits on the floor in place of Audrey. That morning, the gang pull up to Zach's house and make a beeline for the garage, but all they find is a paper doll of him. He's been snatched. But as they reach the landing at the top of the stairs, all that waits for them is a tiny paper doll of Dee. She got got. And then Jenny and Michael spot a tiny paper boat that's carrying a tiny paper doll of Tom. Um, and then she hears the toilet flush. Um, and then Michael is nowhere to be found. Because babes, at this point, if Julian gets hurt as well, it's over and they'll all be trapped in the shadow realm forever. But Jimmy freaking Tokyo drifts onto a curb and gets out and runs in her eight inch heels. She's feeling for the light switches. She's feeling for everything she possibly can. And then she runs into something warm and soft and then she screams. Jenny's inconsolable. She's weeping. She's near fainting. But Jenny ain't going without a fight. She shoves him backwards and he stumbles and falls into his own vortex. Jenny lands in a version of the school cafeteria where Audrey, Zach, Dee, Tom, and Michael are all very shocked to see her, but very thrilled as well. They are all trapped inside a ring of fire, but all of them hold hands and start to walk out anyway because I guess they, they're they all firm believers now. And then freaking Zach, of all people, trips and falls. <laughs> And Tom's like, no, stay here. I'll go back in and get him. As soon as Tom enters the photo, it burns all the way up into a charred black square. <laughs> Your friends are with me in the shadow world. If you want them, come on a treasure hunt. But remember, if you lose, there's the devil to pay. Jimmy's ready to go on a rampage. You want to play, Julian? Let's play. It's time. This is the end the long-awaited grand finale of my video series on L.J. Smith's The Forbidden Game. Hopefully you've seen my other two videos on the two previous books in the series because if you haven't you will be very confused. This is the third book in the trilogy titled The Kill. Now buckle up because this one is going to be insane. At the beginning of our story, Jenny, Audrey, Michael, and Dee are on an airplane. Turns out they have completely skipped school, abandoned their homes, and have become runaways. And Jenny has stolen $600 from her parents. <laughs> wow. Uh, how, how long has it been, exactly? They're flying to Pennsylvania to break into Jenny's grandfather's house. See, Julian has invited Jenny on a treasure hunt in order to win back her kidnapped loved ones, Tom and Zach. But there isn't really an American Airlines economy class round trip flight to the shadow world. And if there was, it probably wouldn't even have those Biscoff airplane cookies. So like, what's the point? So they figure Jenny's late grandfather's basement is the best lead they have to try and find their missing friends and smack the ever loving ice and shadow out of Julian. I admit Jenny's character has been growing on me a lot, even though I still think she's absolutely no fun. Like to reject a hot icy shadow prince in favor of your current boyfriend who wears khaki cargo shorts, mm-hmm. But I get it. Like how some people like to play the most exciting levels of a video game and others, like Jenny, are content spending all their time on one side quest. Live and let live. In the first few pages of the book, LJ does the thing she's done in the previous book where she tries to find an easy way to wrap up the entire plot line thus far via Jenny imagining writing a letter to her parents. And then she gives us this line, quote, they were all 16 juniors in high school and they were on their way to fight the devil, end quote. Ooh, I bet she thought she popped off with that, didn't she? Jenny thinks about Julian, and once again, how exotic he was. I feel offended for Julian at this point. Like, she's not even trying to like him for his personality. Granted, at the moment, his personality is kidnapper and stalker, so... But then she panics and thinks, now let's flip the script and fantasize about my actual real boyfriend, Tom, before I get too excited about Julian, who I definitely hate now and do not harbor any romantic feelings towards. Jenny falls asleep and has a weird nightmare where a tiny elf is trying to get her to go to this amusement park that she liked when she was little. And when she wakes up, 
The airplane is plummeting through the air. I, come on, really? The airplane's crashing now. And Jimmy's like, oh quick, um, think about Tom. You should be thinking about Tom before you die. I, uh huh? All I'm saying is at this point, it's getting a little performative. But then everything's fine. The pilot comes over the intercom and says, it's just turbulence. But a second ago, Dee's body was nearly hitting the roof of the plane. What kind of turbulence is that? Anyway, they land safely in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and take a taxi to Jenny's grandpa's house, which is still miraculously intact and empty, even after 11 years of dormancy. Like, let's be real, in today's market, that house would have been flipped into an Airbnb within 10 minutes of Jenny's granddad disappearing. Since Jenny doesn't have a key or anything, the kids decide it's a great idea to break into the house with crowbars. But Audrey sees a sign that the entire property is alarmed by a security system, so that puts a little wrench in their plans. Or should I say crowbar? <laughs> I'm crazy. Why an empty house is equipped with full security, I don't know. Jenny suddenly remembers her grandfather's old housekeeper, Mrs. Derosh, who might still have a key to the place. If that housekeeper is still, 11 years later, taking care of a house owned by a man who's been stolen to the shadow realm, that is employee dedication. But who's paying her? To find Mrs. Diraj, they need to find her phone number. And to do that, they need to also find a phone book. This was written in 1994, I think. Makes a lot of sense. Jenny leads the gang to a local dairy bar, which I hope is an ice cream parlor. Using a payphone, they learn that Mrs. Darash is still the caretaker of the house, but she can't let them in until 7 p.m., which is nine hours away, so they have to kill some time. A convenient bus passes by that's apparently headed to Joyland Park, which is coincidentally the amusement park that Jenny dreamed about on the airplane. Naturally, she drags her friends onto the bus in order to get cotton candy or whatever. On the bus, Michael reveals that he also had a kooky dream on the plane, but one where Summer's disembodied head was accusing them of abandoning her. Everyone else is like, oh, oh, okay. They arrive at Joyland Park, and it's kind of what you'd expect from a small town amusement park. Jenny and co. all start to thaw out a little bit, have some fun, and enjoy their youth for once. They're going on roller coasters and eating corn dogs and they enter a fun house. Now why would they do that? Of course, there's a moment where Jenny gets spooked by a fun house figurine that's supposed to be a cliche red devil, but then she notices its eyes are blue and then it winks at her. I'd be out of there so quickly, I'd be out of there immediately. They see this circus train car and on the side of it says, Leo the paper eating lion. It's not even an attraction, it's just a lion with a hole for a mouth and you throw trash into it and there's like an animatronic vacuum that sucks up the trash and an automated voice line plays out as if the lion just ate some food. So basically it's a way to encourage children to throw trash away. Leo's a bit creepy, but ultimately he's harmless, you guys. You guys, he's harmless, you guys, don't worry. The group learn that there's a park-wide challenge where you can collect doubloons hidden around the area, and if you get three tokens, you can get to enter an attraction called Treasure Island. No, not that, Treasure Island. Hmm, treasure, that sounds familiar. Almost like something Julian had said to Jenny before. But Jenny's too stupid to connect the dots, so she completely ignores it. I'm assuming the majority of this final book is going to be given like goosebumps, escape from the carnival of horrors energy. Jenny decides to go do one of those carnival fishing games and she drops her fishing line in. And when she pulls it up, at the end of the line is the golden ring that Julian gave her. Now I'm having fun. Like I just love him so much. What a creative soul. Jenny immediately drops it back into the water and they all just walk away. Like not today, <laughs> we're not dealing with this. We're not dealing with him. Let's go girls. They leave the park entirely and head back to Jenny's grandpa's house to meet up with Mrs. Darash like nothing happened. Mrs. Darash just gives Jenny the key and the instructions to turn off the alarm. Not, not asking any questions to this group of 16 year olds who flew across the country to gain access to an abandoned house, okay with no parental figures in sight. Then they have to figure out how to get from Mrs. Darash's house to Casa Grandpa because it's like a mile away. So they're about to take a taxi when Dee points out that they're flat broke. How? On the airplane together, they had had about $2,400 between them. And a domestic flight from Cali to Pennsylvania was probably like, I don't know, 400, 500 each. That would have left them like $800 together. How did they spend it all in one day at an amusement park? The bus fare could not have been that high. Audrey talks about how the amusement park tickets were like $13.95 plus park food. Okay, I guess. But no, I don't see how that budgeting pans out. Why didn't Dee say anything if she saw that the money was running out? So apparently these kids are destitute now. So they walk the mile to Casa Grandpa. <laughs> what do I say? 
So they walk the mile to Casa Gran Pa and plan to spend the night there, sleeping in shifts. At least in their luggage, they do have snacks and other supplies to carry them through the night. They enter the house, disarm the security system, and finally make their way into Grandpa's basement where all of his supernatural occult collections are still there. They ransack the old man's stuff until Jenny finds his three journals. Oh, Gravity Falls moment? Word? It's time to crack open the books and have a little study sesh. Apparently Grandpa has filled all three journals up with various summoning rituals for shadow men, aka fairies, aka aliens, aka others, aka elves. Man was obsessed for real. And for what? It just keeps saying that he wanted their power to walk between worlds, but, but why? And what would a human even do with icy shadow powers in the first place? I think the motivation behind his whole occult operations are just a little bit too ambiguous for me. We need a spin-off book series featuring a prequel that follows Grandpa Thornton and his wacky adventures in contacting the dark forces of nature. Jenny's peeping some of the notes about runes and summoning circles and she gets a little light bulb over her head and grabs a knife. She rounds the troop up and tells them, all right, wouldn't it be kind of slay if we carved the falling runes on a door and then we stain them with our blood and then we chant their names to charge them with power and then we open the door? And everyone's like, no. Well, Jenny starts fucking doing it anyway. One by one, she draws and carves them in order. Runes for a catalyst, a thorn, a sacrifice, ice, fire, traveling, and then finally the same rune that had been on the OG paper house back when they played the board game. A rune for a portal between worlds. Jenny's feeling a little unnerved that one of the runes is for sacrifice, so she makes a mental note like, oh yeah, by the way, watch out for sacrifice in the near future. <laughs> okay, Google, set a reminder for don't forget about sacrifice. <laughs> oh, and by happenstance, Jenny also accidentally slashes her hand with a knife, so she has blood now to smear on the runes. Yay! At this point, they're all feeling that typical rush of adrenaline that you get when you and your homies are performing the dark arts. We've all been there. So they gather up all their belongings before they complete the final task, which is to say the names of the runes and invoke the, the whatever. I don't, yeah. Also, we have a new outfit moment for everyone. Survival chic. Plus they were smart and they brought some useful wilderness survival items like a matchbox, aspirin, flashlights, tea bags, okay, uh, and toilet paper. All right. After she finishes the final rune, the door starts strobing black and white and everyone's a little freaked out. The circle of runes starts spinning and glowing and then everything stops. Jenny pulls open the door and beyond the threshold is nothing but blackness. As the kids walk through the darkness, they start smelling popcorn and the door slams behind them and disappears. When they all turn on their flashlights, they are back in Joyland Park. Everybody gangsta until they're in a deserted amusement park at night. And especially if that amusement park is in the shadow world. Jenny and friends don't know if this is the park itself or a parallel universe replica of the park. I mean, it, it is the shadow world after all. So maybe the shadow of the park is like a reflection of its real world counterpart. Very Jordan Peele us moment, but like for a roller coaster. Immediately the kids are all like, wow. This place sure is creepy. What well, y'all literally volunteer to traverse the veil between worlds. Grow up. Dee is instantly psyched because she's like, oh, babes, it's simple. Julian wants us to be in an amusement park that we were just at. So at least we know the ins and outs of this place already, as opposed to some icy hellscape that we were originally expecting. They hear rushing water and go check it out. And it's the fish pond with a single fishing pole perfectly propped up, ready to use. D grabs it and tries to fish around and uh, a water zombie explodes out of the pond and grabs D and tries to drag her into the depths. Jenny describes it as a man with no head and his skin is bloated, kind of like someone who had drowned. Instantly, everyone's up and running. Jenny tries to grab the monster, but then she's like, oh, this thing's skin feels like the leftover food bits that touch your hand when you're washing dishes. So she just straight up lets go and recoils in disgust. Jenny, Dee is going to die. <laughs> At this point, everyone's pulling at Dee's legs to try to get her out. Meanwhile, her entire head has been shoved inside of the pond and she's kind of like low-key drowning. Jenny jumps back into the fray and decides to do a full Nelson on the water monster until it finally lets go of Dee. The gang skedaddles as far away from the pond as possible, out of breath and waiting for their heart rates to slip back into the two digit range. Here's the thing, the shadow world pulls from their subconscious fears and everyone has known this since the paper dollhouse. So instantly they're pointing fingers like, okay, who conjured the decaying aquatic flesh beast? Was it you? Was it you? Um, and Michael says his dad used to have a Halloween mask of a drowned man. That's pretty fucked up by the way. And so Michael assumes the body they saw was from his childhood nightmares. But then Jimmy says, oh, 
Hold up. Why did its clothes look familiar? Oh, I remember now. Those were the same clothes that Slug was wearing when he and PC were following me that day. <gasps> Gasp. The dead bodies of Slug and PC are there in the Shadow World. My precious boys, Slug you and PC Ethan. Julian's messing with corpses now? Like, oh, maybe I was a little bit too quick on my initial judgment of him. Maybe he is a little bit demented, dastardly, and demonic. Jenny starts freaking out. Even though Dee is the one who almost died, she's like, I'm making this about me now. So she starts jumping to conclusions and says that if Slug has no head and Michael had that one dream where the head of Summer was talking to him, then maybe Hereditary 2018, Julian's been doing this to all his victims thus far. That means since Summer died in the Shadow World, Summer's body could also be wandering around the park. And what if they see it? What if they see her? What if they- Dee slaps Jenny across the face. End of sentence. Dee tells her that this is not the time to lose it. They have to stay calm and they knew what they were getting into because it's the shadow world. She says, if we let this get to our heads, we're dead before we even start. I would just like to bestow upon her the ultimate badass award. Dee suggests that they grow boss up and uh, we weaponize themselves. That's not the correct verbiage, but I'll leave it. She had a hunting knife before, but it fell into the water when she was struggling. Uh, and Jenny's wimp ass knife that she used to carve the runes isn't gonna cut it for D. So she suggests that they all go to the mining themed roller coaster ride to get pickaxes and shovels. I'm officially in my D stan era. The other three teens agree, but Jenny's like, I'm sorry, I'm a little icky. I wanna go wash my hands in the bathroom first. <laughs> Obviously, girl does not understand that the only thing scarier than a headless, rotted zombie is a public amusement park bathroom. And the only thing scarier than that is a public amusement park bathroom in the Shadow Realm. But they all wash up with no incident, and Jenny is getting ever more suspicious because usually by now, Julian would have popped up and said some vague romantic stuff and tormented her a little bit, but he's nowhere to be seen. I guess he's sitting back letting his art do the speaking for itself. They're walking down the streets towards the mining ride when a weird, gray, malformed shape flits across the path in front of them. Everyone's like, absolutely not, absolutely not, no. We'll deal with this thing when we come back from the mines with our pitchforks and fire. Down in the mines, they're looking around the animatronics for adequate weapons, bold of them to assume these things aren't hollow plastic because why in the world would an animatronic designer add a 50 pound sledgehammer to a robot that's required to move constantly? But then again, this is the shadow world. So yeah, they try to lift a sledgehammer from one of the mine dudes and it's real, but way too heavy. They move on through other stage scenes along the rail tracks like collapsed passageways, flooded mine shafts, a hanging, a, a hanging? Well, they also pass a saloon with skeletons in it. Okay, why would those last two things even be in a mining themed ride? They finally come across a little scene where the miners are holding pickaxes and knives and pistols. Dee finds a long pick and calls dibs. Michael chooses a pitchfork. Jenny and Audrey both choose a couple of small weapons. They're all set. On the way back, they're following the rail tracks of the ride like they were before, but they look down and the tracks have split into two paths. They could have sworn that they followed one path thus far. Instantly, everyone's arguing over whether they noticed this or not, but Deed's convinced that there was only one track before. Jenny's like, okay, well, let's just take the path on the right. End of discussion. And if we're going the right way, we'll see all those animatronic scenes that we saw coming up. Um, they start walking and they don't see any scenes. They're completely lost. I mean, are you lost if you've been going the correct way, but the scenery is physically changing around you? They're walking and then the tunnel turns and Jenny's like, hey, do these walls feel a bit tight to y'all? She turns around and everyone's giving her a look and she's like, okay, fine, whose nightmare is this? Dee confesses that she's claustrophobic. And so maybe the idea of having a mine caving in on top of them would be her ultimate fear. Jenny's like, good to know. We'll keep that in our back pocket as we're trying to get the hell out of this cave. And they try but the shafts keep getting smaller until eventually the ceiling of the tunnels are brushing against the tops of their heads. Gradually, they realize that the rocks are real and that this is a bona fide gold mine that they are now crawling through. Dee mentions that once she did have a nightmare about a cave collapsing in on her. Now, why would you say that? You know, as soon as she says that, Julian is slurping up that idea so fast and injecting it straight into their reality. Okay, Audrey says a line in French. And she's done this throughout the whole series. She knows a bunch of different languages and I haven't remarked on it but I do know enough basic French to know that there probably should be an S there at the end of Compan. Um, so let me just. Yep, there we go. The wall starts shaking and quaking and the floor gives out from underneath them at the same time the ceiling collapses. All Jenny can do is fall dramatically. She loses her flashlight and her hammer and her bag full of useful items. 
This marks yet another moment when Jenny and her friends have been knocked unconscious or passed out across the past 500 pages of this trilogy. Julian is so wrong for continuing to play mind games with 16 year olds that have all had about six concussions each. Jenny wakes up alone, completely alone, with nothing to her name crumpled among the rocks of the cave and she can't move. And she hears a voice. It's Julian. He reveals himself to her by drawing the rune for fire and he manifests a torch so she can see. And of course we get a new outfit for him as always, but to be honest, it's kind of similar to the outfit from the original house. It's hilarious because every single time he shows up, Jenny's like, all right, girl, you've got to brace yourself. You got to stand your ground. And every single time she lays eyes on him, she's like sand through an hourglass, but he's not here to be nice this time. She's like, you wanted me here? So I'm here. And he's like, yeah, and you're pathetic could barely even survive a cave-in. Like, how embarrassing for you. Giving Jenny some props here, she has changed, and she isn't really into this whole dynamic anymore, and neither is Julian, weirdly enough. They're both pissed off at each other in this scene, and like, stone-faced, and no one here is playing games. Why does she, why does she just leave? Like, call it off, here and now. Oh, because Tom and Zach are still missing. I forgot, dear Lord. I think Jenny also forgot, because suddenly she asks Julian where Tom is, and instantly he's like, you bitch, you haven't been thinking about him. Like, <laughs> And Jenny's like, well, he got me there. <laughs> he got me there. But I don't need to think about Tom every moment to love him. Pretty much the opposite of what she was trying to do in the beginning of this book, but go off. Jenny asks for a clue, but Julian says he doesn't give free handouts. So Jenny grabs him this time and kisses him with the force of a Boeing 77, but like in an angry way. How come LJ's descriptions actually kind of touched my soul here? Like woman did pop off a bit with the lyrical prose. Julian is extremely caught off guard and he's trying to savor what he can get, but Jenny's strictly business and she pulls away first. LJ describes it as cheap and nasty. And I went like, no, what? When she pulls away, his eyes are described for the seventh time as exotic. And he's upset. He literally says, I did not get my money's worth. I know icicles that are better kissers than that. Jenny says, I know dead fish that were better kissers than you. Now, now what the, what? She can't celebrate for long because need I remind you all, he is 12th dimensional paradox galaxy gigabrained. So he's immediately already thinking up ways to get back at her for that comment. Julian, if you can't take the heat, then get out of the kitchen. If you can't take the read, get out of the library. If you can't take the feed, then get out of the app. I'm just, I'm just saying stuff now. On a whim, he decides to flip a coin. Head Julian wins, tails Jenny loses which I thought was funny because that means he wins twice. But all he does is flip the coin towards Jenny and tells her that her first clue is to collect three doubloons around the park in order to reach Treasure Island, which is something we previously predicted about 50 pages ago. Jenny's like, oh, so this whole park is modeled after the one I used to go to as a kid, right? Because you love me so much, right? And Julian's like, no, humble yourself. This isn't about you. This shadow park already existed since forever ago. He mentions that Tom and Zach are on Treasure Island. So Jenny's like, oh sweet, I already have one coin too, so thanks for the head start. And he's like, of course, sugar honey pie, cutie face. Um, now all you have to do is escape from this collapsed mine shaft without my help. And he disappears. Jenny feels around in the dark, finds her flashlight, and realizes that she is in the tiniest, smallest, cramped space, surrounded on all sides by dense rock. She can't live, laugh, love her way out of this one. She gives up and sits down. Honestly, I would too. While she's sitting, she starts hearing these voices and then she sees little flashes of eyes through the gaps in the rock and they remind her of the eyes from the shadow people that she's seen in the closet before her grandpa got taken. Then as if her day wasn't already going a little sour, she realizes that there's water trickling down from the ceiling and it starts pooling at her feet and it's freezing cold. So she could drown and or hypothermiate now. For a second, Jenny gets a big head because she knows that she has plot armor, but then it hits her that Julian might be mad enough at her to literally let her die. And that thought is wild to her. She's like, yeah, sure, I can tell him I hate him. And we can do this back and forth thing where we're gonna be mortal enemies forever. But for him to let me die, unfair. It's a sticky situation because on one hand, Julian isn't entitled to Jenny or her love and affection. But now that he realizes that, all of a sudden Jenny isn't entitled to Julian's mercy anymore. Totally healthy dynamic, am I right? Suddenly the gears in Jenny's head are turning. The whispers from the shadow people and the eyes that she just saw a couple minutes before the water started pouring in. Maybe Julian isn't doing this. Maybe she's about to die because he actually does not know she's about to die. Maybe this is actually the work of Julian's 
parents, siblings, aunts, uncles, and cousins. Remember that in the first book, we did learn that Julian is the youngest shadow person of them all and that they can operate separately from each other. When she was five years old, the majority had wanted to kill her, but her grandpa stepped in before that could happen. Even back then, Julian was at odds with the rest of his family. So what if his family has come to finish the job now that Ginny is on their turf in the shadow realm? Jenny deduces all of this within four minutes while half submerged in freezing water, but a few minutes ago she was really struggling to connect the concept of doubloons and Treasure Island. So suddenly there's a new conflict here, and Jenny believes that Julian is acting separately from his kind and just wants to capture Jenny. But now the rest of the Shadow People are intent on actually trying to Roblox exit game Jenny. I'm excited because this possibly means that Julian could get a bit of a redemption in this last book. Every storyteller knows that if you want to soften a villain, you introduce a villain 10 times as worse as them. And I'm not complaining. Julian has done some horrible, evil, disgusting stuff, but also this is fiction. And also he has white anime boy hair. Trust me, if he was a brunette, I would have disowned him from the start. Jenny's like, I have an idea and oh, 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 it's magic, you know, oh, oh. She remembers what Julian did earlier. So she draws the magical rune for ice and the water in the cave stops rising because the trickling source is frozen over now. Jenny thinks her problems are solved, but then she realizes that all she's done is a full metal alchemist transmutation. She simply swapped one issue for another one. The law of equivalent exchange. Because the water's gone, but now the freezing water that she's still waiting in is gonna freeze her to death. So she passes out and feels herself sliding underneath the water. For once, I would just like to see her win. At this point, what are her other friends doing? Because it's not as if they're just waiting in idle mode every time Jenny's away from them. I assume they're also individually dealing with their own issues. Jenny's mind is a fog. First, she thinks about Tom, but then she thinks about her parents. Finally, it only took lying and stealing money from them for her to start remembering that she has parents. She's wondering how her funeral would be. She's numb, but then she feels heat. Then she can feel that she has a body again. Her hands and feet start warming up because there's a fire burning near her. She's been saved. I mean, that's obvious, we knew. We knew she couldn't die here because there are 151 pages left in this book. Someone's calling her name in the distance. And she's like, damn, this guy sounds really scared and desperate. But look, Tom, I just can't bother living right now, so come back later. But this person sounds so distraught and full of pain that she's like, okay, fine, Tom, I'll give myself a revive. And she opens her eyes like, all right, where's Tom? But it's not Tom, it's Julian. He's absolutely a mess. He's rubbing her hands to try and warm her up and he's moved her to another cavern somewhere where there's a DIY fire blazing next to them and she's lying on a white fur rug. What a ridiculously glamorous way to be saved. She's kind of taken aback because she's like, this isn't even Julian. He looks terrified and worried and I've never seen him with emotions like that. <laughs> He's never been sensitive or vulnerable like this before. Yeah, I think we all know that Julian's getting a massive redemption arc because there's no way Jenny's gonna kill him at the end of this. Not when he's just earnestly saved her life. When she's fully awake, he's like, OMG, I thought you were dead for good. I'm literally shaking and crying right now. I have no idea what that water ish was about. I didn't do it, I swear. And he supports her head and tells her to drink this warm, sweet liquid from a cup that he just whipped out of nowhere. And Jenny's like, I could get used to this. He's being an actual gentleman, but no, he can't be. He's not capable of tenderness and affection. She's shocked. And he responds like, I am once again asking you to realize how much you mean to me. And Jenny's basically like, oh, okay, well, I know you've hunted down me and everyone I care about, and you've put us through mental, emotional, and physical agony. And you currently have my cousin and boyfriend as hostages somewhere, like 30 feet away probably. But <laughs> we're in a secluded cave together and I don't see anybody else around. And this fire is quite warm and cozy. Let's put the past in the past. He tells her that he's devoted to her in ways that are borderline unhealthy. And she basically says, but you're a goth and I'm a prep. We're just too different, Julian, it won't work. And then Julian starts listing off all the reasons he's super into her and how she's so gorgeous and sweet and compassionate and trustworthy and strong and fierce. Jenny goes into her Bella Swan mode and she's like, no, I'm, I'm not beautiful. <laughs> Tucks hair behind ears. I think this still doesn't excuse the fact that he's like, as old as time itself and she's 16. <laughs> Why couldn't he have waited until she at least graduated high school? Not like that makes him less of a groomer, but bro, she needs to be studying for her SAT right now. Julian's talking about what it's like being him, how earth has vibrant colors and he wants a piece of that beauty and light, but can't have it because he belongs in a dull world. So that's why he loves Jenny so much. She's so lively. 
Jenny tells him to simply move to Earth and freaking get an apartment or something, but he says, no, I can never change. Not permanently. I'll always be what I am. Shut up. Just shut up. <laughs> so tired of this. He talks about how he was never born, but all the shadow people were written into existence through runes. Okay, yeah, I, I can see how that would actually pose a problem in the real world, like getting a birth certificate, trying to get an ID, telling officers, sorry, I don't have a driver's license. You see, I was birthed via a conjuring of runes. He says that all of the runes that brought him and his people into existence are just written on a piece of board somewhere, but he doesn't know where. And if you ever slash the runes out or destroy the board itself, him and his people will disappear. Why do I feel like that's going to be a paramount piece of information towards the end of the book. Jenny's reeling from all the trauma dumping that Julian's done for the past 10 minutes. And she's like, okay, I have to admit, if he had approached me and courted me like any other fine young gentleman, Julian could get it hands down, but he didn't. He didn't do that. And that was his first mistake. Despite this, she does start picturing herself as a queen of darkness with a black silk dress sitting on a throne in the shadow world with like a white tiger at her feet. Basically the stuff you'd see airbrushed on the side of a van. But then the guilt sets in and she starts thinking about Tom. So she gets up and tries to walk away from Julian, but oh no, she stumbles and he catches her. She tells him that she just can't do this anymore. And so he finally accepts that she doesn't want to be with him. He lets her go, but not before giving her the best kiss of her entire life that leaves her knees weak, palms sweaty. She describes it as the saddest feeling she's ever known. But then she thinks of Tom and when they were kids and how much she loves him. <coughs> Coping. <coughs> anyway, Julian also realizes that she's still hanging on to Tom. So he gives up and just tells her that the game is still in full effect. <laughs> he's like, he's like, hope you enjoyed all of my genuine heartfelt confessions, Jenny. Anyways, let's just keep playing the game. He starts to act like his old self immediately and reminds her of the three golden coin challenge. But then he points out that while she was literally freezing to death back in the other cave, oh, she must have lost her first golden coin. Aw, so she's essentially starting from scratch. Aw, you know he did that on purpose. <laughs> I don't believe that that was an accident. <laughs> he points Jenny to a convenient exit and then he just kind of slinks back into the shadows. He's sulking. Um, I'm realizing that we're getting a little too much of a redemption arc with Julian, like so soon. In, in the book. He's just getting to be a little bit too much of a baby girl. I'm feeling a little too fond of him at the moment. And I can sense when a writer is about to do some effed up sugar honey iced tea. Also, I don't know what it is about this third book in particular, but LJ has started using the word queer a lot, but in the way that people in the 1800s used to use it, like to refer to something as just being like odd. A queer shiver ran down her spine. What a queer notion. What a queer... Like, I, <laughs> I've noticed this popped up five separate times already. Three of those times were within 12 pages of each other. On one hand, I've noticed that she's decreased the weird racial descriptions of D only a little bit. But as a result, now this queer thing is popping up. Once again, the law of equivalent exchange, people. Jenny exits the cave and runs into all of her friends who always make sure to conveniently gather where the plot needs them to be. They talk about how she's been missing for two hours and that they found a way out of the cave safely, but she was the only one they couldn't find. Jenny tells them she saw Julian, but decides to leave out the unimportant things like the other shadow people trying to kill her, her getting trapped in a flooding cave, how it felt to die, and Julian saving her. So really the only thing she tells them is that they need to find three doubloons to get to Treasure Island to get to Tom and Zack. Also, she hasn't even thought about Zack once in the book so far. I wonder why LJ even bothered having him and Tom trapped together, since Tom was already the lowest common denominator to make Jenny go buck wild anyway. The gang start looking around the park for doubloons and that brings them back around to Leo the paper eating lion. Jenny's glancing around and she notices a glint of gold inside the trash chute of the lion's mouth. It's a doubloon. Everyone's like, uh-uh, you couldn't pay me enough doubloons to make me stick my hand in there. But Dee talks about how Audrey hasn't ever really had to do anything to pull her weight thus far. In retaliation, Audrey decides that because of her three inch acrylics, she is the most capable of grabbing the doubloon from the mouth of the lion. So she does and she grabs the doubloon and Leo the lion's face morphs into something out of a horror movie and suddenly Audrey's arm is trapped between giant sharp teeth. Who could have seen it coming? 
They try pulling her out, but that's a no-go because she would like to keep her limb intact. Jenny tells Dee to use her pick as a wedge to pry the teeth back open. Meanwhile, everyone else is screaming and sobbing, sliding down the wall. Dee successfully pries the jaws apart and Audrey yanks her hand free, but not before tearing huge gashes into her arm. Is she I? Right? Because there are like arteries in there. They decide to solve the problem by wrapping a shirt around Audrey's wounds and giving her as much aspirin as humanly possible. But Girlie got the gold coin. She gives it to Jenny and the group is revitalized, happy to be one third of the way through the game. Dee won't say it, but she clearly feels guilty because she's kind of the reason that Audrey got maimed by the lion. Jenny and gang catch sight of an arcade. When they enter it, they see old fashioned machines and automatons and Nickelodeons. They split up to look inside of the machine coin slots to find any potential doubloons. Jenny finds a creepy fortune telling machine and decides to try that one out. Jenny puts a dime into the machine and the wizard inside the machine springs to life. The automaton reminds her of something, but she can't quite put her finger on it. This wizard's like twitching around in the box doing his mechanical movements. His eyes are rolling back into his head. Then they meet Jenny's eyes and she's like, that is my grandfather. A card pops out of the machine that says this. Jenny, horrified, collapses on the spot. She's gooped and gagged right now because now why would Julian do that? I'm, I'm imagining that he laid out all of these like horrific attractions for them in advance when he was super mad at her. But now, <laughs> but now that Jenny has nearly died and he saved her and they had that very tender moment, he's probably pacing around his room right now like, ah oh, shit, I forgot to take down the animatronic that has her grandpa's captive soul. Shit, maybe she'll be chill about it though. <laughs> like maybe she won't notice. Jenny is not being chill about it. Her friends are trying to comfort her and she's kicking, screaming, crying and wailing because a dear grampy soul is stuck forever inside this wizard contraption. Jenny remembers when Julian told her that the park had been created exactly 10 years ago. So she realizes that the other shadow people probably created this entire shadow theme park to put her grandfather in there to torture him. Like, what did this man do? Like, as if the World War II vet status wasn't enough for him to witness the horrors. The mechanical grandpa wizard knows it's Jenny, and so he spits out another fortune card, telling them to look at another one of the fortune telling machines behind them. Jenny recognizes the machine, and it's one that usually has a skull on a table that either nods or shakes its head to answer any question that you ask it. Kind of like a magic eight ball but with a skull. So they put a dime into this new machine to make it light up. You guys, I'm so sorry to inform you that, um, how do I say this on YouTube? The Folgers decaffeinated heads of Slug and PC are stuck on two pikes inside of the case and they're bobbing up and down. Remember when this series started out as a board game? <laughs> yeah, everyone's instantly screaming and gagging, literally this time because like that's putrid, that's absolutely menacing. This is beyond goosebumps now. This is like a fully rated R horror movie. Grandpa hits them with another fortune card that tells them to look in the fun house. I don't, I don't want them to go look in the fun house at this point. To do that though, they have to leave the arcade completely since there were no doubloons there for them. Just a sick and twisted display. Jenny says a tearful goodbye to her grandpa because what is she gonna do? Break the machine? Or just leave him there to find another way to make all of this stop? She decides to do the latter. They hustle on over to the fun house, but at this point, people, I don't think any of us are having that much fun anymore. The whole scene was just a bit of a bummer, like RIP to those real ones. Let it go on record that I've personally never tolerated eternal grisly torture. And I just can't continue to support the shadow people in this one. The whole concept of the fun house is that there's a huge sculpture of Noah's Ark. I don't know, it's like kind of a stretch for a fun house. Inside, they trudge along through the gimmicky sculptures of animals and these weird fake jungle sounds playing over the loudspeakers. They find themselves walking down a dimly lit hardwood hallway where both sides are lined with gruesome displays of medieval torture scenes. What audience are they trying to appeal to here? This is a fun house. It's twice as bad because they're forcing themselves to look at every scene that's been laid out because they're terrified of finding Summer in one of the wax figures. But besides that, they still also have to look for another doubloon. They see a table that has a huge disc of spikes on a chain above it, and on the table is a body. And on that body is the same dress that Summer had been wearing when she died in the mansion. They're all kind of freaking out about this. Uh, Jenny approaches the body because they're still not sure if it's Summer. But when she's about to get a close enough look, the saw above the table just swings down, just for fun. Jenny grabs the body off the table and, oh, it is Summer. 
It's actually her, like she's still alive. In fact, Summer wakes up thinking that she's just had a long nap. Instantly her friends are suspicious, but Ginny declares that it's the real Summer. Ugh, everyone thinking that Summer's dead and mourning over her and lying to their parents and friends about her disappearance, only to find her alive and well, is such an Alison De Laurentiis thing to do. Everyone is ecstatic that she's alive. Me, I'm kind of, I'm kind of meh about it. I still don't really know a thing about her character. She never had a personality in these book series. Nonetheless, they wrap her up in a big group hug and they're crying and it's a huge endearing moment. But Jenny looks up and starts seeing some more eyes floating in the shadows. So she's like, right, up you are. Let's get moving. Let's go, people. They're close to the exit when Summer suddenly asks if she can have some candy from a nearby gumball machine. Read the room, Summer. Audrey jokes to Dee that Dee should put her hand in the gumball machine, you know, for payback for what happened to Audrey's arm, which makes Dee a little bit pissed off. Jenny starts freaking out like, do you understand the situation you're in, Summer? That gumball machine probably spews out grenades or individual human fingers for all we know. But then Summer puts a coin in and it just spits out some M&Ms and also a gold doubloon. Hey, look at that. So now they have two out of three coins. So Jenny's like, I stand corrected. We're all going through the revolving exit door when Jenny suddenly steps into a room like she's been pulled into another reality. A light flickers on and Julian is there in his most depressed of states also with a new outfit change. Ginny is just so happy to have Summer back and alive that she practically runs to him and actually verbally thanks him for something that he's done. Julian's being all sullen and pouty about it and he's like, yeah, you're welcome. I gave her back to you. Like, yeah, okay, I didn't kill her, but I'm still evil. And now Jenny's like, I guess I'm giving you a pep talk now, okay? So she says, look, you did a good thing. This is good. We're making progress towards you being a decent person. I can change you. <laughs> He says that he only did it out of selfish reasons. So he's still a bad person. <laughs> God. Oh, he's such a pick me boy. It's infuriating. Jenny forces him to admit to her that he never did any of that stuff to her grandfather or slug and PC. He confesses that, yeah, it was his family that created all those mutilations over there in the arcade. Apparently when slug and PC let him out of the closet he was trapped in, when they saw him, they ran and busted out of the mansion and into the shadow world beyond the house, which is when Julian's relatives just ate them up. Suddenly, Ginny realizes that Julian really is the youngest and most immature shadow man because he's all bark and no bite. He constantly threatens Ginny and her friends and tries to pull little tricks on them, but ultimately he's a harmless puppy. Julian says, um, it's still evil though that I put Summer into a deep sleep and I let you guys think that she was dead. Like, that's kind of really rude of me. Jenny's like, ah, it's water under the bridge, baby. You're not like the other shadow men. I can fix you. And then she voluntarily kisses him. <sighs> Jenny, Jenny, you and your non-committal flip-flopping shit. This isn't Burger King, girl. You can't have it your way. Even Julian is getting whiplash at this point. He pulls back and he's got this stupid Edward Cullen complex going on where he tells her that he's gonna convince her that he's completely beyond help. So dangerous, a stone cold heartless killer. He gets so mad that she's figured him out, so he dematerializes out of embarrassment. At this point, for Jenny, Tom is out of sight, out of mind. She's thinking about him less and less out of love and more out of just guilt and obligation. Like it's almost as if she has to save him, not because she loves him, but she has to save him because she kind of feels like she owes it to him. Nevertheless, she tries to convince herself that Tom was her entire objective the whole time and that nothing has swayed her resolve, not even Julian, and that nothing's changed and that she should just forget all about it. Sorry, but why am I actually invested in these scenes so badly? Obviously, this is an entirely dumb and stupid situation ship they have, but it still has me pinned down a bit just because of how crazy it is. Like, look at this one paragraph. It's like shocking to me because I absolutely hate romance as a genre, but the nostalgia, it's possessing me. I, I can't get enough of the drama. Everyone's waiting for Jenny as usual when she leaves and they're all pretty much like, yeah, it's kind of obvious where you keep disappearing to for 20 minutes at a time, but they all still don't know the actual extent of their wishy-washy, will they, won't they, enemies to lovers dynamic between her and Julian. They all still think that she hates his guts and that he's like pulling her into all these asides. But Jenny's like, you know, like, I hate you. And he's like, wow, not for long. Um, little do they know that they've just been open mouth uh, Frenching. The group takes a look around and of course, the only ride left that's lit up now is the tunnel of love. The narrative here is just getting a little, uh, just a little self-indulgent, but I keep drinking it up. So I'm the problem. A swan boat is waiting for them when they get to the tunnel of love. 
They climb in the boat and it starts slowly sailing them down this dark passageway. Usually there are romantic dioramas on either side of the boat, but now it's all black. Go girl, give us nothing. <laughs> well, suddenly their flashlights are giving nothing as well, as in they blink out and it's pitch black. Their boat suddenly stops moving. Then spotlights on either side of them flash to life, one by one. Surprisingly, Julian is there himself, in the icy, shadowy flesh, and he has a new fit, even though it's been four minutes since the last one. The book says he looks urban and barbaric. <sighs> LJ Smith? More like TJ Maxx with the way this book series just oozes white suburbia. Ooh, he's wearing an armband and a vest. What a street thug. And he rarely makes appearances to the whole group. Usually he reserves that until the very end of the game. So this time it's personal. He's still pissed off at Jenny, so he wants to show them that he has their third and final golden doubloon in his hand. The five of them are just like, oh, what could he possibly do? He says, I just want to talk about how pathetic you all are. Oh, <laughs> just like the most randomest. <laughs> Oh, get him. He's in a bit of a Malfoy mood, so he just kind of verbally abuses them for a second. And Jenny's like, damn, have I hurt your feelings that badly? She's trying to defuse the situation before someone gets angry and slash or killed. So she's like, you guys, isn't this the perfect time for us all to be extremely calm and collected? But Julian is out for blood. He's just got his library card because he begins reading all of them for filth using his knowledge of their inner fears. He tells Dee that she's stupid and that's why she can't get into college, telling her that her athleticism is a front for her insecurity and that her impulsiveness is what got Audrey injured. Dee is not having it. He's riling her up so bad and Jenny's just trying to rein her back in. But then Audrey starts standing up for Dee and telling Julian that he's wrong and Dee's actually amazing. She says that Dee is smart and clever and brave. Michael joins in too, so then Julian turns his reading glasses on Michael now. He tells him that he's a coward and afraid to stand up for himself, which is why he's the class clown. He calls him a joke, basically. But Michael is like, this is nothing. He's probably like, I get way worse verbal abuse from my girlfriend <laughs> because he does, really. Then Julian turns it up a notch and starts telling everyone about how Michael essentially has OCD and starts describing his coping rituals to them. Apparently none of his friends knew about this. I, things are getting a little too real here. Julian is relentless though. He tells Michael that Audrey laughs at him behind his back and that she's openly admitted to using him as a placeholder. And Audrey is flabbergasted because, I mean, like Julian is telling the hard truth. Like she can't even be mad though. She is genuinely a bad girlfriend. Jenny keeps trying to calm everyone down. Like, hey, you guys, we're all 16 year old adults here. We can handle this. We're mature. Audrey admits everything to Michael, but she makes the point that she said all those things in the past. Okay, but like Audrey, girl, literally a week ago during prom, you were making out with another boy. How far back are you considering the past? She admits that she's deeply in love with Michael and she hates that. So that's why she acts the way she does. Okay, there goes my Audrey XD hopes and dreams, but okay. Anyway, it's enough to put the pet back in Michael's step, even though I think they should still break up. Julian sees Audrey comforting him and he's like, target acquired. So he latches onto her now, telling her that she's a painted mannequin and that she's going to end up a quote, shallow and contentious bitch like her mother, end quote. Mm-hmm. This is a PG-13 book. As much as I wanted a redemption arc for Julian, um, this whole scene is kind of just crossing the line for me. It's gonna be pretty hard to redeem him. But did I laugh when I read that though? Because he's never once cursed in the entire series before? Yeah, I did laugh. Am I a bad person for that? To be decided. Dee stands up for Audrey, so then Julian just tries to start tearing into Summer. But before he can do that, Jenny jumps out of the boat and she's like, if you have something to say, say it to me and say it to my face. She literally wades through the river of love and jumps onto the platform to confront him. She's like, let's get personal. And he's like, no, I don't think I will. Actually, I want to get general. Let me start telling you about the horrors of the world since the dawn of time that I've personally witnessed. So he tries to scare Jenny with all of these facts about parasites and human torture methods and violence in LJ Smith's eyes. It's just like, there's this one scary bacteria and like they used to cut people's heads off <laughs> and then like people do drive-by shootings. Like that's like Elche's like idea of like, I mean, they're all bad things, but like her idea of this is the worst of humanity. And it's like, okay, well, look, we, we get it, but 
there's also like, you know, white collar crime and shit too. Like, come on, let's be honest, LJ. Jimmy's like, okay, I get it. There's a lot of evil in the world and life is horrifying and horrifying things have happened before. You don't need to tell me that. She says, there are good people, people who are swag and slay, like my grandpa and Dee's grandma. And you can't make me think that just because darkness exists, I should want to live my life in it. I do care about the evil ways of the universe, but you know what? I also care about you, Julian. Oh, that gets him good. He's like, what? He's so shocked. And Jenny tries to reach out, but before she can touch him, boy is gone. He has apparated. And the only thing left is the doubloon that he had, which clatters to the ground. She actually scared him and made him run away. Man wants to be loved, but does not want to face the mortifying ordeal of being known. Meanwhile, her friends are in the boat and they're just kind of staring at her because, um, Jenny just said some stuff, some interesting stuff that none of them quite expected. Like, what was that word you used, Jenny? Mm, care. Okay, mm-hmm, cool. I wonder if Tom knows about that, mm-hmm. Now Jenny's realizing that what she said is actually true. Before, with Julian, it was all surface level attraction, but now she knows for a fact that she does love him. B but not as much as Tom, though. Still not as much as Tom. Like, she's, like, that's, yeah, no, definitely not. Everyone's silent. No one says anything as they make their way out of the tunnel, but Jenny does notice that at least they're all holding their heads up a little bit higher because they've all been strengthened by that bonding exercise. When they leave the tunnel, the park is still deserted, but suddenly all the rides are lit up and moving and everything feels awake. Now that they have three coins, they decide to head towards the bridge to Treasure Island. But first, Jenny redirects the group back to the arcade so she can chat it up a bit with her grandpa some more. She asks him, would you mind if I used this rune to put you out of your misery and destroy your soul for good and let you rest in peace, grandpa? And his wooden mechanical automaton wizard body is just like, yeah, go right ahead. Jenny's tearing up and she carves the rune of sacrifice onto the glass with her little knife. She speaks the name of the rune and the mannequin in the case goes buck wild and then basically starts convulsing like something out of the exorcist. Then he's gone. The automaton is now just a wooden wizard. One last fortune card spits out of the machine and it says, thank you. Is the screen getting a little blurry for anyone else here? Because it's so strange. I think there's something wrong with my eyes or something. Dee points out that um, there are two other souls trapped in another machine right behind them who just saw everything. So it would be a little rude to not allow them to go into the afterlife too. Jenny turns to Slug and PC, just reminding you once again that these are the decaffeinated heads of two ne'er-do-wells who still did not deserve a death like this. Also, Jenny's inner dialogue is still so freaking rude to these poor boys. Even in this moment, she's thinking about how pathetic they look and how they were never cute in real life and they're even uglier in death, grotesque like dogs. Damn, Jenny, can we stop judging the disembodied limbs of the victims? Jenny makes sure to get their full consent first because you can never be too careful. But both of them clearly want to be freed, so she repeats her little liberation ritual. She realizes that this is technically murder, but she doesn't have the time to think about that right now because there's an attack. There's another zombie that's broken into the shop. But instead of it being the watery, bloated zombie that was Slug's body earlier in the fish pond, this time it's PC's headless body coming to try and interrupt Jenny from freeing the souls. Obviously it's being possessed by the shadow people who are currently a little bit mad at the gang for trying to take their toys slash prisoners away. Dee just starts fighting. Like I just want to say that Dee is the ultimate fighter because throughout the entire three book series, she has usually been the only person to actually physically fight something while everyone else just kind of watches. Dee's swinging around a pickaxe and slamming the body into cabinets, but like, Guess how much easier it would be to defeat a headless zombie if, I don't know, it was a five to one battle instead of a one to one? Like why are the rest of the kids just kinda sitting there? Anything goes in the shadow verse. Biting, scratching, kicking, punching, everything's fair game. Just like jump in, help a sister out. Michael takes the opportunity to finish the ritual and smears his own blood on the runes and Jenny says the name out loud, thus completing the official exorcism. So the heads in the case go limp and the zombie that was terrorizing them goes limp Problem solved! Jenny and crew have had more than enough excitement in there, so they just call it and leave to go back onto the street. They make their way to the bridge, to Treasure Island. This is it! Is everyone seated? Does everyone have a snack and beverage? This is going to get good. This is the finale. They make it to the base of the bridge, which has a toll booth to deposit the three coins so you can get through the turnstile. They're climbing the bridge, which is starting to get really steep 
and impossibly high and has no OSHA code guardrails on either side of them. So Jenny's freaking out a bit because she's deathly terrified of heights. As they're climbing for what feels like forever, they look down underneath the bridge and realize that they see other bridges leading to other floating islands below them. So Audrey's just like, babes, it's obvious. Those are the nine worlds. Like, did you even study Norse mythology? We're leaving the shadow world. And oh look, there's Asgard above us. Yeah, there's probably some gods up there. No big deal. Jotunheim's over yonder kicking it with Muspelheim. This all makes me think back to the first book when Julian mentioned that he was Loki. Like, how? How? He lives in the Shadowverse, in what LJ suggests to be Niflheim, so he has no affiliation with Jotunheim, so that makes no sense. Also, if he's the youngest of the Shadow People, there's definitely no way he's a god as old and as powerful as Loki. When he can't even control his own Shadowverse because his Shadow relatives are more OP than him, there's just, like, make that make sense. Also, the gang happens to look down to see actual hell, so, um, don't stumble because that's a one-way trip. Their bridge is headed straight to Niflheim, aka the Shadowverse. Wait, 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 what? Then where the hell have they been the whole time? A pocket universe? I thought they were in Shadow World, but they're heading to Nifl- like, they're going to Shadow World. Jenny powers her way through the vertigo and they make it to the other side. Everything in this book is such a trial. I, I just want them to walk into that lighthouse and for Tom and Zach to be right inside the door and for them to leave and for Julian to take up other hobbies. Once they step off the bridge and look back, they realize that the bridge is way shorter than they remembered it being as they were crossing. So Audrey says that all of that nine world stuff back there was probably just a mass hallucination and there's no way there can be gods and elves and fairies and other dimensions. Audrey, look around you. Now make that make sense. They enter a giant lighthouse and it's not really a lighthouse, it's a giant pirate themed indoor mini golf course. Okay, that's cute. Julian may be a master manipulator, but he's got style. There's a large diorama on the wall and there are two plastic boats perched on some rocks. Inside one of the boats is Tom and Zach. Just, just there. Jenny doesn't even think twice. She sprints towards the two of them and there's like a tender reunion moment where Tom and Jenny are smooching and Zach's there like, can I get a rescue? Can I please get a rescue? Can I get a waffle? Can I please get a waffle? Jenny uses her knife to cut the ropes from both of their hands because once again, Julian loves a hostage in bondage moment. Everyone's freed and they're all reunited, standing in the middle of this pirate golf course. And technically, they've won the game. So then why do I have 40 pages left? And how come Julian isn't showing up? Oh, yep, speaking of Julian, he randomly appears and he's so weary. Baby's exhausted. Jenny faces him and Tom's there instantly behind her, supporting her. But Julian just looks at them and Jenny realizes he's done. He's over it. He knows he'll never have human love. Jenny's thinking like he's really out of it. He didn't even show up before I cut Tom and Zach loose. Like his head's not even in the game anymore. Tom sees Julian's depression and he just wants to book it out of there. But Jenny says, no, something's wrong with him. He's just agreeing to let us go. And he says he won't bother us ever again. And that's not the possessive and obsessive Julian I know. Julian has ascended to full emo status. He turns his back to Jenny and Tom and he just tells them that they've won and they should just leave before he changes his mind. There's a door in the back of the room and everyone can see the warm glow of Jenny's grandpa's basement. If they make it through that door, they're all finally free to live their lives, like for good. So everyone just starts booking towards the door, kind of awkwardly. After a few seconds, Jenny rips herself from Tom's grasp and actually tries to run back to Julian. And now Tom and Dee are on both sides of her holding her back, like Jenny, leave this asshole alone. But she's like, I can fix him. And Julian's like, get her out of here. I don't even want to see her anymore. What kind of soap opera behavior? Tom physically picks Jenny up and tosses her over his shoulder to force her to leave because Julian's patience can only go so far. And at this point, Jenny really is making it worse for him. He's finally willing to stay alone for eternity and just let it go. But now she's the one holding on. She realizes that she does want to save him. She wants to return a good deed because He's been kind of nice to her lately, but Jenny, do you understand that him being good in this final installment only makes up for like 10% of the things he's done to you and said to you and your friends? There's still a deficit there. Jenny's friends literally make a wall between her and Julian and she's so upset that they're ripping her away from her magical self-deprecating boy toy. But before they reach the door, uh-oh, some icy tendrils of mist and shadows interrupt them. It's the shadow people manifested in their physical forms. 
along with a whirling mix of ice and wind. It's just as Jenny remembers them from her grandpa's basement all those years ago. The entire group is plunged into a blizzard all of a sudden, and the shadow people start surrounding them. And they're nasty. They're being described as like humanoid pieces of beef jerky, and they're a little stinky. <laughs> One comes up to Jenny and it just says some vague stuff about like wanting to steal her away. So Jenny looks over like, Julian, um, what are the shadow people doing here, perchance? He's like, oh yeah, Jenny and gang, meet my ancestors. Ancestors, meet the love of my life, Jenny, who you are absolutely not allowed to call dibs on, and her kind of mid-friends. Jenny's like, so these creatures are like actually your family? And Julian tells her that, yeah, if he lives long enough, he'll start to shrivel up and look just like them. Now, I like to think that I'm not a shallow person, but if I heard that, and I was Jenny, I know beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but it would be a little hard to muster up the strength to behold that every morning as I wake up next to it. Despite everyone else's disgusted reactions to the Shadow Man and to the idea of Julian looking like them one day, Zack is the only one mildly interested, which not to start up a debate or anything, but <clears throat> a new theory has suddenly hit me with the force of an 18 wheeler. If Julian really is so obsessed with Jenny and like her vibrancy and whatever, I mean, there is the option of romantically turning to Zack who is her cousin and is pretty similar to her, I would think. Think about it. We know for a fact that Julian has not only watched Ginny throughout her entire life, but in the first book he weirdly mentioned that he knows a lot about Zack's life too because he watched both of them. Uh, uh, weird. Also, we've known that ever since the first book, Zack has had like an increasingly hard time accepting reality, and he can barely make art anymore because his mind always goes back to the Shadow Realm. He's fascinated with the Shadow World. And as an artist, he wants to capture something real. To him, the most real and beautiful thing he's ever seen was, was there in the mansion. He, he mentioned it in the second book. He's never really been scared of Julian's monsters. Even in the second book, when he was confronted with the giant snake, he just kind of wanted to take a little picture of it. My headcanon. <laughs> I think that Ginny is too much of a normie for Julian. If he had been going for Zack the entire time, I guarantee you, that any artist wouldn't hesitate for a second if you asked them to accompany you into a magical realm. <sighs> Not to turn this into a Julian X Zach video, but I think there are some considerations to be made. I mean, it does suck to be a rebound, so sorry, Zach. And of course, it's still it's it's still messed up with the whole like I watched you and your cousin when you were children, haha. <laughs> yeah, it, mm -hmm, but it's still better than whatever the hell Zach and Jenny have going on. I'll just say that. Anyway, back to the present. Jenny is just as shallow as I am, so when she hears Julian explain how his race starts out as beautiful but then kind of turns ugly over time, she's like, ew, that's nasty. <laughs> she's like, never mind. <laughs> Julian starts doing that passive aggressive thing that teenagers in movies do, and he says, yeah, these are my ancient ancestors, but they're not supposed to be in my room because I have strict rules about them barging in without knocking first when I have company over. One of his relatives speaks up and is like, well, your little buddies over here stole our prey from the arcade machines. You know, we had leftovers, Julian. Julian's like, but you guys were done with the old man. <laughs> and him and his ancestors have this whole whiny back and forth thing. It's pretty funny. They say that by law, Jenny has to take her grandfather's place now to make up for the souls that she released. But like, whose law? Which law? Mama, show me the law and I'll have my attorney contact you post haste. Julian can't really argue against them because they're like all powerful and all knowing. So the shadow people start to steal Jenny and envelop her in a thick fog. But then he's like, starve it, wait, no. So his family is just like, we'll wait. If you don't want us to take Jenny, just give us somebody else then. Tom's like, I volunteer as tribute. Then Dee's like, no mate, I'm gonna be the sacrifice here. Zach is like, I'm her blood relative, I guess I should go. And then Audrey and Michael step up, just to be followers really. They, basically everyone's tag teaming. Summer is the last one to step up and volunteer, but she surprisingly does step up. Julian's silent, he says nothing. But then Jenny's like, no, I'm not letting you guys sacrifice yourselves for me. That would be like super not cool. The original deal is still on the table. I'm going. She tries to walk towards one of the shadow men, but Julian physically pushes her out of the way. <laughs> When it was her friends volunteering, he was like, I sleep. But as soon as Jenny's like, nah, I'm gonna go, he's like, real shit. Julian is ready to fight. He tells Jenny and company to make a run for the door while he holds off his family. But one of his uncles is like, oh, we playing games now. Let me just materialize your ancient rune real quick so I can have your entire life force in my hands. Say something, young man, I dare you. Julian doesn't back down though. Jenny and her friends get closer over to the door while Julian's covering them. But meanwhile, his arguments with his family are escalating until his shadow uncle 
reaches up and slashes Julian's rune. Jenny is screeching and Julian's like, I've been hit, but he takes it with dignity and grace. Jenny, of course, runs to his side so he can have like a big, dramatic, beautiful death scene. Oh wait, no, instead she and her friends just physically pick Julian up and they run towards the portal and leap back into her grandfather's hallway, but like with Julian's body. <laughs> they were just like, no, nah, this is all gonna happen to go. Let's, <laughs> let's get him up. The door portal thing slams behind them. Michael gets up and slashes the runes so that the shadow man can't come through and they all realize everything that's just happened. Julian's lying on the ground, weakened from essentially getting his soul stabbed, I guess. That's family for ya. Jenny takes his hand. Now here's the big dramatic beautiful death scene moment. She thinks back on every time she's seen him before, the many expressions and emotions she's seen him wear, the cold, cruel boy from the first game, the beautifully passionate boy from the balcony during prom. Basically, she's having her movie montage moment. At this point, her friends have all moved away to give them some emotional and physical space because this is such a heart-wrenching scene. Julian's saying shit like, you showed me what it's like to love, <laughs> which is not helping the situation and it isn't making me cry less, but he does tell her that Conveniently, the shadow people can't come back after her again because because he's technically the sacrifice. Now Jenny thinks back to earlier when she carved the rune of sacrifice. Julian gives her a little bit of trivia and he says that the rune for sacrifice is also the rune for gift. And so this is his final gift to her. <laughs> Jenny's like, I'm literally shaking and crying right now. I mean, if Jenny was really smart, she would just ask him to really quickly like draw his life rune or something down so later she can carve it onto something and reignite his life force. Why hasn't she thought of this? Why hasn't Julian thought of this? Probably because at this point he would rather die than to third wheel with Jenny and Tom, which I don't blame him for. He tells her he's just gonna dream another dream and it'll be a peaceful death for him. But then he's like, okay, Jenny, but like all that other stuff though that I've done before, like, do you blame me for it? Like, are you still mad at me for all, for all the evil, for, for, for the evil stuff? And she's like, absolutely not. I don't blame you for anything, Julian. In fact, you've never done anything wrong in your entire life. He tells her he loves her and he hopes that she'll at least dream about him sometimes. Okay, this is officially skewering me through the heart. She tells him that she's going to make sure to dream him into a place with no shadows, only light. Why am I actually tearing up? Julian uses his last ounce of strength to conjure up her ring. The original betrothal ring that he gave her in the paper house, but this time it's just a beautiful ring with a new inscription on the inside that says, I am my own master. It's, it's like a callback to this thing that happened in the book earlier that I just didn't think to write down because I didn't think it was important. Basically, it's a phrase that Dee had taught Jenny and both of them had been using it to get through some of the toughest parts of the night. Then, after that, Julian quietly and peacefully slips away. Once he closes his eyes, he starts dissipating into a cool mist and he evaporates, which is awkward because like, out of respect, should you like hold your breath to not breathe him in? Should you make sure like the air conditioning doesn't turn on and kind of blow him around everywhere? I mean, he's definitely gonna get caught on the air filters in the house if that's the case. Jenny is in utter despair, and so am I. You know what, so am I. But her friends are there to support her. Also, don't forget, she does luckily have a spare boyfriend lying around, and that's Tom, who hugs her in this moment. Even though he still doesn't know half of the things that Jenny has done with Julian behind his back, that's, I guess that's fine. Michael and Audrey take care of a lot of the practical resolution related things, like making sure they call everyone's parents and trying to get enough money for flights back to Cali. Ginny is grateful that Summer will finally be going back home to her parents, but she can't really bring herself to join in on anything because she's still ruminating about her deceased darling Julian and how sexy and sensual and suave and superb he was and how she'll never allow herself to ever forget about him. Damn Ginny, I guess in absence, the heart really does grow fonder because you know she never would have said any of that to his face. And get this, Julian has been posthumously promoted from exotic to quixotic. I literally had to look that word up. But Jenny's like, you know what? He proved that there are horrible, evil things in the world, but despite him being surrounded by all of it and him being literally made of evil, he still proved that there were exceptions to be had. And he was one of the exceptions. Plus, through his tomfoolery, Jenny and her friends can now traverse life a little bit stronger and a little bit closer to each other. That was the real gift he gave all of them. 
Jenny puts on the ring Julian gave her and she looks around at her besties. Audrey and Michael are more openly affectionate towards each other. Zach is more interested in reality and being more present. I don't like this part, but LJ even tries to like slip in like one random line about like Zach staring at Summer. I think it's so stupid. I think it's out of nowhere. I hate it. Summer is, I don't know how Summer changed at all. I don't even think she changed. Dee is more thoughtful and also casually mentions that now she wants to go to college. <laughs> Chom finally doesn't mind being shadow cucked. He sees the ring on Jenny's finger and he's like, I'm just gonna go ahead and make peace with this because she's never gonna stop loving him. I personally think Jenny and Tom are getting themselves into a messy situation. It's one thing to have an ex, but it's another thing for your SO to be hung up on their SSO, their shadow significant other, who was an all-powerful, earth-shatteringly beautiful entity who single-handedly changed her life before dying in her arms. And Jenny's never even told Tom all of the spicy stuff that went down between her and Julian. She's always kept it from him, so he doesn't even know the extent of it all. So in a way, that's like the most fucked up thing about it. Like Jenny's never told him about the stuff that went down. Jenny's never told him about the thing that went down between her and Zach in the first book. I know it was Julian, but like, like I know it wasn't the real Zach, but Jenny was all in. Oh, she's gonna have to start doing some confessional soon or else Tom is going to be in the dark about all of it. And how does that make for a healthy relationship? The kids taxi arrives so they can go run some errands as in giving Audrey's arm some proper medical attention. Yeah, remember that? Then freaking Michael is like, you know, what if somebody just recarved Julian's name onto some cardboard? Like, wouldn't he just come back immediately? And Tom is like, you shut your dirty, filthy, disgusting mouth right now. So they all drop the subject, but Jenny's like, I'm just gonna store that in the back of my mind. Jenny, Tom, Audrey, Dee, Michael, Zach, and Summer all pile into the taxi cab somehow. And Jenny looks up to the sky. She notices that it's a beautiful blue, a blue that she's seen before. She thinks that if Julian ever does reincarnate, she wishes him well. Gotta admit that last line really hit hard. Like a that actually hurts. Oh, it's so hard to wrap up my thoughts about this series. Where do I even start? With Jenny, I guess. I'll be honest, Jenny didn't convince me in the first book or even halfway through the second. She was very hit or miss for me as a character, but I guess that means she's at least complicated enough for me to be able to have feelings towards her. I mean, she's I. That's the only way I can sum up Jenny as she goes through this trilogy. I appreciate that LJ tried really hard to stress to us that Jenny is now completely completely equal to the men around her and she's super confident and no longer weak or submissive. But I didn't even feel that she was that weak in the first place. Sure, she had that one moment in the first book where she put on an outfit that her boyfriend liked. But from the beginning, she was always kind of like, fine, not really in need of much hashtag girl boss empowerment. She had dumb moments and she had smart moments and aggravating moments and moments where she was like big mood. Um, so I feel pretty neutral towards her. It makes sense because she kind of has to be malleable in order for tween girls in the 90s to feel like they could put themselves in Jenny's place. Her friends kind of have their own shallower character development. Audrey, for me, has never been lovable, but she's interesting in kind of like a cutthroat way. Despite LJ repeatedly reducing Dee to athletic black girl, wow, she's so supple and limber and dangerous like a jet black panther. I actually liked Dee in pretty much all of her scenes. She's certainly a great character when it comes to moving the plot along quickly or solving something that requires even the littlest bit of bravery and confidence. Michael's fine. He's basically the voice of the audience, I know. Occasionally he just like gives sarcastic remarks and asks the dumb questions. I still think he and Audrey should 100% break up though. Summer has no personality and I hate her. She's weirdly described as a delicate, innocent little flower who's always on the brink of fainting or crying. I just like, who? Zach is a sweet baby angel that's never done anything wrong in my eyes. He's quiet and polite and no, I'm definitely not biased towards him because we're both tortured artist figures. Tom is, I barely think he's changed. He starts off by being like the jock boyfriend but he's never been rude, like he's never been mean. Then he gets really jealous and that kind of gets annoying. Then he gets into his emotional era and then he goes back to being jock boyfriend light. He respects women now. Julian is, well, 
Um, Julian is, um, like, do I even need to explain how I feel about Julian? During the making of these videos, I never mentioned this, but I had a dream about the bastard. I dreamt that I was in a classroom and the teacher gave us an assignment to translate all of the forbidden game books into French, but we had like an international transfer student coming to class to help us do that. In the dream, I was like, wait, we have a transfer student? And I looked and Julian walked into the classroom and sat down directly next to me and just stared silently into my face. It wasn't romantic at all. It was a threat. I basically like stared back at him and then just ignored him for the entire dream until he just got up and left without a word. So I think that's cool and neat and not at all an indication that I've been working on these videos for way too long. Look, as I said before, this is fiction. Julian has clearly behaved in gross ways and the redemption arc at the end does not excuse his actions, especially not what he said to them right before in that love tunnel. And it wasn't Jenny's job to change him, it was his job to change and he made good choices towards the end, but it was like two good choices. It was just like, you know, of course, the bare minimum of being a decent person. I'll just summarize it by saying, all that was pretty fucked up, but it was a fun sort of fucked up. I'm problematic because I allow fictional stories to change me in irreversible ways. No wonder my 11 year old self only remembers the first book so well. Knowing me as a kid, I probably got as far as this book, but then I stopped when I realized that Julian was gonna die. I did the same thing for Bleach. I stopped watching when I realized that Ukiura was gonna die and I never went back. Either that or I read through the entire book and just practiced some selective amnesia on how the story ended. Or has it ended? I realize that LJ Smith has a to be announced fourth book of the Forbidden Game series that's called Rematch. But because this is still TBA and this book series is about 30 years old, I assume I should go ahead and throw my dreams out the window. Unless I can use my lucrative and robust YouTube celebrity status to pull some strings in the big writing industry. But I will take this as a sign that even LJ probably thinks that Julian deserves to be canonically revived somehow. And truthfully, I'm glad she left the story so open-ended because this is the perfect point where I can begin to write my 99 chapter, 300,000 word fanfiction about Julian's return. Okay, hi. I looked into the rematch book sequel some more and LJ actually is like adamant that this is going to happen someday. As recently as last year, she posted some information on her Facebook page about the synopsis. Firstly, this synopsis is wow. It will jump ahead to the future where Jenny and Tom are about to be married. At first I was thinking, oh wow, an older cast of characters. You know, like I'm, I'm expecting 30 to 35 years old. Like you don't see that that often. But no, LJ, LJ means they're gonna be like 18 to 20 years old. There's also some weird talk of abstinence and that choked me, it really did. You guys, this kind of reads like a fan fiction. Everything's perfect in Jenny's life until four days before her wedding when she wakes up to a silver rose on her pillow day after day. So like Julian is somehow going to pull some strings to ruin Jenny's wedding, even though he's dead, but then somebody revives him, some unknown person. So that's surprising because like, even after him having this big redemption arc in the third book, it's just so funny to be like, oh, fourth book, uh-oh, like psych, never mind, he's evil again and he's gonna mess some shit up. It's like, what? well, you just, you just walked all over what you just, like the foundations that you just laid. Here's my forbidden game sequel fanfiction idea. Donut steal. A 30 year old Zach has just lost his fourth job that year. He can't seem to get a grip on reality. He's still thousands of dollars in debt from art school. He's pressed for cash at all times and he's utterly depressed and dissociative. His cousin Jenny seems to have a great life and over time he becomes so jealous of her popularity and her perfection that he's become estranged from the entire friend group. Zach might have nothing to his name, but he has a good memory. One particularly dark night when he's at his lowest and everyone seems to have abandoned him, he finds himself absentmindedly scribbling down a familiar shape, but he can't pin down where he knows it from. Suddenly, the realization hits, but he continues retracing the rune over and over again, less out of curiosity and more out of a quiet desperation. He thinks back to Jenny's grandfather, who wanted to walk between worlds, to have power and knowledge beyond comprehension. That type of greed begins blooming inside of Zack's chest. The rune glows and shifts, then a blast of light. Since he's been reborn anew, Julian is even more beautiful than ever. But Zack quickly realizes that all of the Shadow Man's memories are gone. He doesn't remember anything. Nothing about Jenny, nothing about the house, the hide and seek game, or Treasure Island. But Zack learns that Julian is indebted to him because he wrote his life rune into existence. Some sort of weird shadow law that compels Julian to be loyal to Zack. So 
He starts thinking. He could use Julian. He could have Julian take him to the shadow world so Zack can gain both inspiration and insanely cool photograph that will propel him into fame and fortune. Throughout the story, he learns that it's much easier said than done. Not only does he have to keep Julian hidden away from Jenny, who would go hysterical at the sight of him, but Zack also has to find a way to evade the fury of the other shadowmen, who are intent on capturing Julian. But Zack's determined to hold on to Julian, and over time he finds himself growing fond of him. After all, they are each other's second chances at life, which means Zack has to find a way to protect Julian at all costs, even if it means traversing across all of the nine worlds. It's a story about forgiveness, about the difficulty of letting go, about renewal, rebirth, love, and loss. But like, that's just my idea. <laughs> like, what? whatever. Don't steal though. Like, like, don't steal that. I also found out that in 2020, apparently, a hypothetical TV series for the Forbidden Game was pitched and maybe it's in development or maybe it'll never come to fruition. But can you imagine the Forbidden Game TV show? LJ, you're welcome for the accidental free marketing on my part. If this video series accidentally ignites a fresh new hype over the TFG trilogy and the TV series actually does get greenlit, then girl, I will send you the bill. And if it does get adapted, I don't want some CW looking yesified cast. I want the visuals and the costuming to follow the same retro style that's on the original book covers. Please, thank you. Overall, this book series is certainly not the epitome of fine literature, but damn, it felt great to experience some nostalgia. I had so much fun making these videos. They have taken so long to make. Like, I don't even think I knew how to edit a video when I was like, you know, it'd be so easy to make as a person who's never edited anything. An entire, like, fully animated, fully illustrated series where I read through this book that has no visuals, so I have to make all of the visuals myself. It was just a lot, but it has been rewarding, and I'm glad that people are, like, really interested in it. So, thank you for watching them. I hope you had fun. I really gotta go right now because I have some things to try and maybe carve on my bedroom door. I may have uh, nicked myself a bit on the corner of the desk here, so <laughs> this blood isn't gonna smear itself. So let's just say that if you see my Facebook status change from single to it's complicated, it probably means I've met a certain icy shadowy someone. Yeah, okay. Goodbye.